All right, thanks for watching. And today I want to talk to you about the fundamental theorem of rank, which explains why the rank is so important. And in another video, I'll give you a couple of cool applications of this. So um, the rank, you can use your favorite definition you want. It's either the number of pivots in the matrix or the dimension of the column space or it's the range of the transformation f of x equals ax. Doesn't matter, in all those definitions, we have the following result, because if you think about row reduction, it transforms a matrix into a nice matrix. What the rank theorem here says is that if you combine row operations and column operations, then you get a super nice matrix which is almost like the identity matrix. So here's a theorem that we'll talk about today. If the rank of a matrix is k, then using row and column operations, column operations, we can transform transform A into a particularly nice matrix D, where D is a following, it looks like the identity matrix, but also has a bunch of extra zeros. So it's IK 0, 0, 0, 0. So it's essentially a bunch of ones, and precisely K ones, and then bunch of zeros. Everything else is zero. So in other words, what this says, you can row and column reduce any matrix into almost the identity matrix. In particular, if A has full rank, you can row reduce A into the identity matrix, which is one of the fundamental facts about invertible matrices. So just to illustrate, if A let's say it's four by three, and k is two, then what would d look like? It's again a four by three matrix, and then with two ones. So one, one, zero, 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 zero. So you see it's kind of like an identity matrix, but bunch of zeros, and I will prove this, but first of all, let me illustrate it with an example which also illustrates what the proof is about. So suppose A is the matrix 1 to 1, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1, 2. First of all, if this is 0 or something, just make it non-zero. So unless this is a 0 matrix and we're done, make sure to swap rows and columns until the first entry is non-zero. And then what do we want? Look at this form. Here we have a one and then zeros in the first column and zeros in the first row. So what we want is really to make all those terms zero. So just use the first row upper, the first entry and turn those into zero. So times minus one, times minus one, and then we get one to one. 0 minus 2, 2, 0 minus 1, 1. And we're halfway done. Now we want this to be 0. With row reductions, impossible, but with column reductions, we can do this. So if you want, multiply this by minus 2 and multiply this by minus 1. And then I believe we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then something like minus 2. Oh yeah, everything else is 0. So minus 2, 2, minus 1, 1. And so the outside looks like what we want. And then basically for the rest, just use induction. And basically what we can show is that for the rest, it also works. But because this is just an example, let's continue. So then here you would divide this by minus two, you would divide this by minus one, and then we get one, zero, 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 uh, one minus one, 
uh, 0, 1, minus 1. Then you subtract this, and we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0. And lastly, make this 0. So multiply, add the second column to the third column, and we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Which is just like what we want. This is I2 and a bunch of zeros. And in particular, the cool thing is, not only does the rank theorem say we can always do this, but remember, row and column operations, they preserve the rank. So in particular, since the rank of this is two, they're like two pivots, the rank of the original matrix must also be two. So rank of A is two, Therefore, precisely because the rank of A is 2, we can also do that. So it kind of goes both ways, which is nice. And there are other cool applications, which I'll show you in another video. You can, for example, easily show that the rank of A transpose equals to the rank of A. But this is not why we're here today. Today, we're here for the proof. And the way the proof goes is simply you do induction on the number of rows. So proof. So induction on M, where A is M by N. Okay, so if you want, well, you can, if you're clever, you can be like, well, if M is zero, we have the empty matrix, and vacuously, we can just transform the empty matrix into another empty matrix, but just, yeah, let's not be, Clever about it. <laughs> Let's do the case where A has one row. Then A looks like as follows. Well, look, if everything is zero, then, then A has to be the zero matrix, and the rank of the zero matrix is zero. And indeed, the zero matrix, trivially, we can transform it into the zero matrix just by doing nothing. So let's assume A is not the zero matrix, so it has some non-zero entry. Maybe other ones. Well, then what you do, using column operations, you swap the f any, you know, that column with the non-zero entry to get that entry and a bunch of other stuff. And then this is non-zero, so you divide this by star to become one, and then a bunch of other stuff. And then you just subtract any number of ones. Let, let's say, for example, this is three. You would subtract three times this entry from this entry to eventually get that everything is zero. And indeed, a non-zero matrix of size one has to have rank one. And indeed, we just transform the matrix of the form I1 and then bunch of zeros. So in this case, the proof is done. And let's more interestingly show what happens in the general case. And it's actually just the same example here. So uh, there's nothing much to prove, actually. Okay, so assume true for n minus one times n matrix, show it's true for n by n matrix. So suppose A is n by n, and the rank of A equals K. Now, if A is the zero matrix, then we're done, because the zero matrix has rank zero, and trivially, we can transform it into the identity matrix of size zero, which then just becomes a bunch of zeros. So, assume A is a non-zero ma non matrix. In particular, there must be some term which is non-zero, using row and column operations, make it so that this term is in the first entry. So it's 
star and then a bunch of other stuff. Then divide the first row by star. And then you get one and a bunch of other stuff. And then just like we did in the example, suppose let's say this is three, five, seven, then subtract, I guess add minus three times, or maybe let me do it in terms of symbols, just so that you're satisfied. So A21, AM1, and then A12, A1N. Then if you want, subtract A21 times the first row from the second row up to AM minus M1 times the first row from the second row. Then what you get is one, A12. So the first row is unaffected, but then the first columns has bunch of zeros and different terms. So it doesn't really matter. And then we have this column is zero, that is good. Now let's make this row zero. And similarly by column reducing, so let's subtract no, A12 times the first row from this row column and then A1n times this column from this column. And eventually what you get is a matrix of the form 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 times, I mean, and with some matrix B. All right, but now we can use our induction assumption because you see B has size strictly, strictly smaller than A. So basically B is now N minus one times N minus one. And therefore the induction assumption says, and I'll come back to this in a second, that using row and column operations, B can be row reduced to IR zero, 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 zero where rank of B equals R. And you might say, oh, wait a moment, this is not quite the induction hypothesis because the induction hypothesis says it's true for N minus one times N matrices. And this is not quite the same size, but it's okay because you can just in modify the induction assumption to say given M for R, N this is true and show that given if it's true for N minus one and for all N, show it's true for N and for all N. So because, uh, because we know it's true for N minus one times anything, in particular it's true for N minus one times N minus one. So what I'm saying is it's really the number of rows that matter. It's not really the number of columns. We have flexibility with the number of columns. All right, that's one thing. And also we know that B can be row reduced to some identity matrix with zero, zero, zeros. But you see, any row or column operation that you do to B is completely unaffects the first row because um, it's like, people downstairs having a party and you're like the neighbor upstairs who can't hear the party. So whatever you do to the party, the, fir the first row never finds out. Because if you, for example, multiply one row by the other, this just still stays zero. So two times zero plus zero is zero. And if you, let's say, switch columns, then those are zero columns, so they will also be switched. So basically this one is unaffected and what I'm trying to get at is, if you row reduce B to this identity matrix, then using the same row operations, you can row reduce this matrix to I0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, IR, and then 0, 0, 0, which is basically the same as, so this is like the identity matrix, and you're just adding another identity part which is IR plus one, zero, 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 zero. So to conclude that we can row and column reduce A to this matrix, all we need to show is that R plus one is K. So if the rank of A is K, you can reduce it to the K identity matrix, but that's not too bad because suppose, the, uh, suppose Let's say a basis for the column space of B is just two, three, four. 
or two, four, five, I don't know, and one, two, three. So let's say, suppose those columns form a basis for the column space of A, of B, then in that matrix with zeros and B, this becomes a thing zero, two, four, five, zero, one, two, three, which still are linearly independent. So those are linearly independent, and that's why those are also linearly independent, and they form a basis for this column space, for the matrix with bunch of zeros and then B. And the question is, what about this extra vector here? Well, look, this extra vector is definitely not in the span of those two vectors. Because if you take any linear combo of those two, the first entry is still zero, but this is non-zero. That's why this vector is not in the span of this, and the beautiful thing is there's a linear algebra called the intruder theorem, of which I have a video, that says if you have linearly independent vectors and you have a vector that's not in the span, you can still add that vector to your set and still be, be a linearly independent set. So you see, so this thing then would still be linearly independent and you see, this is a basis for the column space of this matrix. So if you add the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, you get a basis for the column space of the whole matrix, which tells you that if here there are r vectors, by definition of the rank, the new basis has r plus 1 vectors. So the rank of this matrix which is the dimension of the column space of that matrix, is just r plus 1. But we assume that the rank was the same as the rank of A, which is k. So what we get is that indeed r plus 1 equals k, which is a very tedious way of saying, well, this matrix has to have rank exactly less than 1 of the rank of A. So that's why this works. So indeed, r plus 1 is k, and we've just shown, using kind of induction, that if you row reduce a, you know, you can row, re if rank of a equals k, you can row reduce a to become sort of like the identity matrix, but with a bunch of zeros, and therefore induction assumption is done. So given m, we show this true for all m, and then it's done. All right, so I hope you liked this proof. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.